program delving into the world of books and their authors. Your host, Mr. John Siegenthaler, Chairman of the Freedom Forum First Amendment Center at Vanderbilt University. Hello, I'm John Siegenthaler. Once again, welcome to A Word on Words. Once more, we're back with the man himself, Waylon. Waylon Jennings, welcome back to A Word on Words. Good to be here. Good to have you to talk about your book, Waylon, an autobiography, uh, which you wrote with uh, uh, Lenny Kay. And I, for those who watched last week, uh, we went through that very tough uh, childhood. Uh, we traced your tracks out of a cotton patch where you left <laughs> a sack of half-filled cotton and, and uh, went off to make your fame and fortune uh, in music. Along the way, you lost a couple of fortunes, but uh, somehow you've always made <laughs> yeah. them back. We went through uh, your four marriages, and, and uh, the one now that's last, and uh, you had a silver celebration with, with Jesse, the wonderful Jesse. I said last week that one of the most fascinating aspects of this book, besides the uh, tragedy and triumphs of Waylon Jennings, told in his own words, and aside from the photographs, the family album collection of photographs yeah. that tell your past with your relatives and your friends uh, and your contemporaries in, in country music. Uh, beyond that are the funny, funny stories. And I, I, I thought, just for our audience, we might, we might just recite sure. a few of those, give them a little taste of, 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 uh, of the zest that this book is about. Now, we talked about your grandmother saying, nasty, nasty, <laughs> nasty, when you talked about girls. And you found that at times on the stage, you'd make eye contact with some woman in the audience, and it was very clear what she had on her mind. <laughs> there was this one uh, that's in there about, this is my claim to fame. <laughs> For years I said that. <laughs> this old boy and this girl, well, everybody, Wynn Stewart, Buck Owens, they were coming backstage and said, well, you get out there. I said, there's a girl right in the front row about to, four seats back and said she is beautiful and sure enough when I got out there I saw it and I had just gotten a divorce and there I was you know and I was looking at her and had this old boy sitting there right beside her so I come off the stage and I said this the guy the promoter and I said hey if you want me to play for nothing you go get that girl <laughs> I mean, she was that good looking. You know? <laughs> anyway, and uh, well, it seemed at the time, anyway. <laughs> Sound like a wonderful trade to me. About that time, around the corner she came, and she says, and uh, she come over there, and right behind her was that old boy. And so she said, I want to talk to you. And he said, and, uh, but he won't let me. He keep following me around. And I said, well, who are you? And he said, I'm her husband. And I said, oh, really? And uh, I said, I think that's legal. <laughs> she came around. Anyway, she, I said, just wait a minute. And my mind's going 900 miles an hour. So I said to him, I said, you got a real problem with her, hadn't you? And he said, yeah. And I said, you know what? I just left one myself. She was a blonde. And I took her home. And you know what? I said, as long as you chase her, she's, gonna, she's just going to be doing all these things all the time. She won't care a thing about you. But when you drop her, they can't take that. He said, what do you mean? And I said, well, why don't you just tell you what you do? So just turn around here and say, I'm out of here. Well, I used a few other words. <laughs> and so he said, what will that be? And I said, well, I left one just like that, and she's been calling me every night <laughs> trying to get me to come back. He said, really? And I said, yeah. So <laughs> he said, you think it'll work? And I said, I know it'll work, man. Stand on your, you got to stand on your feet, you know, and stand up to these people. So he turned around and made a few signs and talked and said something to her and just walked out like a giant. Time he got around that corner, I said, come on, girl. <laughs> Let's get out of here before he figures this out. Now, about 10 years later, I'm in L.A. at the Palomino Club, and I went back, and there sat that girl. And I said, she said, you don't remember me, do you? And I said, yes, I do. When did he figure it out? And she said, he never did. Said he went home and said, her dad, he told her, your dad, what he had done, you know. 
And he said, she said, my dad called him Big Dummy, Big Dummy. <laughs> <laughs> well, then there's the story about, uh, then there's the story about, about your, uh, your often but not always friend, Tom Paul Glazer, <laughs> and uh, you were having a great, uh, having a great relationship with him then. It was during that period when you were very, very close. Yeah. And uh, you backed into his Lincoln Continental. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it I went in. I didn't know how I was going to tell him, but I had backed into that a brand new Lincoln Continental, and I had this old Cadillac that I would jump curbs with. So I went in there and I said, "Tom Paul," I said, uh, "Who gave you a great new guitar?" And he says, "You did." I said, "Tom Paul, who's always there for you whenever you need him?" And he says, "Well, you are." Tom Paul, who's your best friend? He says. Well, and Jenny, you're my best friend. I said, Tom Paul, who just backed into your new car? <laughs> 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 and uh, all of that just went out the window. <laughs> I don't forget where you started or stopped calling me names. <laughs> you know, you, you talk about the uh, influence of blues on, on country music and, uh, and your upbringing in the rural south. Uh, uh, in an environment uh, where there was a lot of racism. Mm -hmm. But in the back of your mind, you understood that blues was black music. And there's a place where you ask the question, maybe of your father, mm -hmm. that's very young, Daddy, what happens if black music and white music ever comes together? And it did come together. <laughs> it sure did, yeah. And, uh, but you know, I've always believed it was the same man singing the same song about the good, the bad times, the woman he's gotten, the one he wants, you know. And uh, I've always, I've always thought that it's just a beat apart, you know, because it's the sing-along choruses and everything. And uh, I've loved blues music. I listen to blues music now. I just uh, got me a new Jimmy Reed. I got m more inspiration. There's as much inspiration out of him as anybody. The old blues singer, you know. And uh, they. Uh, but I asked my dad that one time. I did, and I I grew up in, like in the cotton fields. You work with with the uh, with the black kids and things like that, right alongside everybody, you know. And uh, the thing was, I was not intentionally racially prejudiced, but it's something that I grew up around. And now, even to this day, you know, I have to fight that because when I think that. When I when I see someone, I don't think Negro, or you know, and uh, and I hate that. I hate that that I was taught a difference, that there was a difference, you know. But I was definitely taught that not only by my mother and my dad, you know. I mean, I don't remember daddy too much, but Mama kind of used that, and uh, and she didn't mean anything. She was taught the same way, yeah. and that's the that's the hateful thing about being raised in the South. You know, mm -hmm. I said, uh, I said, Waylon, last week that uh, the great virtue in this book is its candor and, mm -hmm. and, and your, your eloquence and candor very simply stated. One way the music, the black and white came together was with the king. You with bet. Elvis. Elvis. That was great, you know. I mean, and he was right there in the middle of the blues, you know, in the middle and uh, the rock and roll and what have you. What a great thing it was when I first heard it. I was, uh, it wasn't long after what I'd said to my dad when I was driving to, uh, to work before I was in radio. In the morning I'd turn it on and I'd try to leave at 8.30 because they had Hillbilly Hit Parade on that radio station there. And I heard, uh, that's all right, Mama. And that went right up my spine and I mean, I had never felt anything like that in music. Oh, Bill Black on that bass, and Scotty playing the guitar, and Elvis just flogging that guitar, you know. And uh, that is exactly what I was thinking about. I would, I probably, I'd have never found it, but uh, it'd been something close to that. But that, and then the Blue Moon of Kentucky, and uh, that. Uh, see, at that time. Is, is I look back now on that music, before that came along, they didn't worry about the feel. 
the rhythm. A re you know, they could, uh, you could cut a record and it could double in tempo-wise. Nobody worried about it. They depended completely on country music. They depended on the singer and the soul of the singer to sell it. Well, why not have both? Sure. Um, the uh, the uh, phenomenal success you've had uh, in many ways has been based on your own understanding of who you were and what you wanted to be and what you wanted your music to be. And as we said last week, there were times when you had to fight to get that done for yourself and we recounted one instance where you fought to get it done for Willie Nelson. Uh, but the, but it's, it, it seems to me that it's true of the great stars of country music and some of those with whom you interacted, uh, uh, Johnny Cash, uh, Chris Christopherson, uh, others. They were individualistic and it was their own style that they insisted on. Uh, and while there were a group of you who were known as the Outlaws and four of you became known because of an act as the Highwaymen, in every case, it was uh, individualistic, whether we're talking about Cash or Christopherson or Willie or you uh, or Tom T. Hall or whomever. Uh, talk a little bit about, about, about that need for the, for, the, for the professional performer, for the entertainer, uh, to be as he or she sees himself or herself, as opposed to the way uh, the producers may may see you. You know, um, I've always believed in producers, and I've worked with some good ones. Even when I got my first deal, that uh, said that I could produce my own records, I immediately got me a producer because I believe, you know, you need everybody. So, and what I always wanted to do, I give them control until they get out of control. Music, to me. I mean, you can hurt my feelings more over music than you can a lot of things. It takes a lot more because, I mean, when it doesn't come around, when it's not, you know, when I don't have any control in it and other people are doing it, you know, I can't do that. I just can't live that way. And uh, it's not because I'm an outlaw. It's not because I'm anything. But I am a sensitive human being. And when I write a song, I usually can tell you what it's going to sound like at the other end. Now they, uh, you know, like when it comes to the, and that's the way John, that's the way Chris. Chris will get the credit one of these days, he has to. He was one of the greatest things ever happened in this town. He came in here and everybody was writing these kind of little, the great songs. Right a here lot in of Nashville. Great songs. Yeah, right here in Nashville. Then here comes Chris writing these great love songs and got everybody off of their rear and got them to working again. But, uh, and I remember when I first heard some of those songs, it just threw me for a, a loop, but every one of them were wonderful. You know, there's one of the things you talk about in there is, is the way that country entertainers share in writing music. You tell about being in uh, Lion Ball's Cafe maybe one night. Mm -hmm. You'd been to Tootsie's Orchid Lounge, come across the Lion Ball's late. Tom T. Hall was in there. You were struggling with a, with a, with a verse and a song, stanza, yeah. I guess, in the song. You sat down, he helped you with it, you got up and left, you didn't see him again for 10 years, the song went on to be a hit. <laughs> that was, it was the strangest thing in the world, and that's the way it works still, you know what I mean, like every once in a while you'll run into that, some of the old, that's the way we work. That things, interaction you know? in the Nashville scene really yeah. sort of serves the purpose of, yeah. of country music. It really is, you know, writing with somebody is fun. I, um, now, Roger Miller, Jesse one time says, why don't you write very much with other people? And he said, oh, I'm kind of like a raccoon. I like to get my little thing, get over in the corner, you know. <laughs> and that's the way he was. You know, what a great writer that was. Oh, sure. I mean, he was phenomenal. I, we started working, picking some songs one time. And there was a hundred sheets of songs came to the publishing company. It beat all I ever saw. But he was so productive. He, but he wrote alone, you know. He was better. He, you know, you talk about the downside, too, in the book. And uh, you talk about your problems with, uh, uh, with uh, the companies. Mm -hmm. uh, you had a great relationship with Chet Atkins, but after Chet uh, moved out of that chief executive's role or maybe moved into it and turned you over to others, uh, Danny Davis and others, it really didn't work very well. And then there were problems with tree publishing. Uh, and, and you write about, about those very, very candidly. 
And part of what you were talking about there was not just t your own creative juices uh, not being able to work when you were in that environment and when you were dealing with business people, but also um, you had the sense that, uh, that you were getting ripped off. And you ultimately went through a series of lawsuits to get your, what you thought was your rightful share money. You also write very candidly about the fact that you went to drugs, um, pills mostly, but later cocaine, during that, that whole period. Well, and how much of the problem um, in dealing with other people, uh, how much did the drugs have to do with that? You know, uh, there's no way that you're, that you're right, right on right on anything when you're on drugs, because uh, I mean, I'll admit that the thing was, it uh, and it caused problems personally, like between me and Chet, and uh, between me and, and and some people. And then, of course, you had the ones sitting there telling you that you're really great on drugs. You know, you had all of that. But I tell you, the thing about it, I had an uncanny ability to be right on and keep. And uh, you mean on stage? Yeah, on stage I or could perform. Or in the yeah. recording studio. And I had the constitution of ten men. I could stay up five days and nights and nobody would even know it. You know, you couldn't. I just was strong. I was very strong. But as far as uh, with the record companies, I hate to say this, but it's still that way. This is a wonderful, wonderful business to be able to sing songs and play your guitar. But when you come to this town and they say, we love you, We'll take care of you. They have another meaning, you know. There's a there's a thing that they do now that's uh, that's so wrong. It's a, you know, um, it's like paying a writer only uh, like seventy five percent of what he has coming, holding in reserve fifty percent. And when you when you audit them, it shows that they have only paid you fifty percent. But then you have to sue them and they'll settle with you and give you 50% of that. They, uh, and then they want such control over the music. Somewhere in the background, you know, like uh, with the producers nowadays, you know, they usually got publishing companies. And uh, I really feel sorry for the people in the business now. You know, I mean, the young, young artists and what they're having to go through because well, you, you, you say that, that uh, you had problems with RCA, you had problems with Tree, uh, you had a problem with your, your uh, booking agent, mm -hmm. uh, Lucky, uh, Lucky Moeller. Uh, Neil Ration seemed to be a, a person uh, if, uh, who was sort of a financial whiz from New York who helped uh, you and helped Willie Nelson, mm -hmm. uh, uh, who was having great financial problems, as you were, um, get, it all, get it all together. Um, and and uh, and still, I I, <clears throat> I wonder. I know you went through that period where you got it all together. Then you became an outlaw, and then the highwayman began to hit, and everything was rolling, and everything was going great. And you had that you had that house, which was your office, really your operational headquarters, mm -hmm. there on Music Row uh, in in Nashville and in Music City. And and then suddenly you found out <laughs> all the success, all the money, and eight hundred sixty thousand dollars in debt. You know, oh, I, I was just overdrawn, 860. <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, yeah, I was in the double, bank. That's yeah. right. The bank said you're 860 yeah. thousand dollars overdrawn. I was two million dollars in, in the hole. You're two million dollars in the hole. <laughs> they, uh, I couldn't believe that. You know, I mean, here I am, but it was my fault. Now that was all my fault because of one thing I've learned. I'm a good businessman now because I pay attention. I have wonderful people around me, but I give them the time. Because, you know, what I would do, they would come to me and say, what are you going to do with this? I don't know. I don't want to hear about it. Go on, you know. I never checked. Never checked nobody, you know. And, never, uh, and the thing was, is like, if you don't care about it, why should they? And that was, in a nutshell, what it amounted to. Some of the things I owed, I had, I owed 2,000. I had 2,000 outstanding bills. Some of them were $5.00. <laughs> that they were going to sue me over, you know. Right. And um, it's just that I let it go. You, you know? made up your mind, though, you were going to pay them all back. I did it. And you yep. headed for Vegas, where you made what? $250,000 for a week. Yeah. yeah. So it's Except not bad, it's, you know, and, and you set some aside mm -hmm. every week 
until you got everybody paid back. Now paying back two million bucks, that's pretty that's pretty I was hollering I was the hottest thing going right about then and broke. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Whoops, there's something wrong here somewhere. <laughs> but I had what I had to do is, is get back involved in it and I had these two girls that worked for me. One of them was at, uh, uh, she came to work for me for eight days and stayed there eight years. Mary Lou was with me for about 18 years. She took the books upstairs at her, at her apartment. And I had this, um, this guy come in from the FBI. He was an auditor and audited everything. And he came to me and he says, you can put a lot of people in jail, but says, you, there's a lot of people with this just, that were just there. And he said, uh, he said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I don't want to put nobody in jail. What I want to do is find me a stopping and starting place. And that's what I did. And we went to work and uh, I worked uh, almost 300 days a year and I paid it back. You know, then you, <clears throat> then you talk about that, uh, that uh, really moment of great crisis uh, when, the, when the drug bust came. Mm -hmm. You say that they had known about it for a long time, and oh, I'm yeah. assuming you talk about they, the narcs, uh, mm -hmm. the uh, the uh, DEA, uh, the law enforcement authorities knew knew about it. But there's a package that's delivered to you at the studio while you're while you're uh, while you're recording, and uh, and that's a wonderful story that we will leave for the viewer to read in the book because it shows yeah. how quick you were, even though you were on drugs, you yeah. managed to conceal uh, get rid of the it. stash <laughs> and get rid of it. And when yeah. the toilet flushed, uh, a couple of those agents said, oh, hell, there it goes. <laughs> uh, but, but you got out of that. And then you decided on your own, cold turkey, you were going to straighten it out. And I'm sure Jesse rejoiced with you. And you did it on your own. Um, there's a lot in this book about starting very early about your religious beliefs. You talk about Jesse and 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 her growth uh, in her spiritual life and 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 your own. And then you, then you reach that that point uh, in the book where once more you d make a disclosure to Shooter, not just about the fact that you'd not graduated from high school, yeah. but the more important admission to him about drugs. T that must have been a tough and telling yeah. moment for you. Well, ten year, I, uh, ten year old boy. Yeah, he was ten years old, and you know, I was, uh, uh, I was very open about it to the to the press. Yes, you were. And uh, about things. I was in the press then, and I remember yeah, very well. The, about because I thought maybe it would help somebody. You know, he wasn't bragging on it or anything, but, uh, so, I thought I'd better tell Shooter. I want to be the one to tell him. You know, and, uh, few you know like. Um, uh, I tried to keep it from ever, you know, ever being in home. Sure. Him. And so I took him aside and I said, Shooter, and w one of the marks, you know, I still cuss more than I should, but I used to cuss so bad. I. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just not <laughs> on television. <laughs> I said, do you remember when Daddy used to cuss all the time? And uh, he said, yeah. I said, well, there was a reason. I said, I wasn't in really control. And he said, what do you mean? I said, uh, at the time, I was on drugs, and I used to do drugs a lot, all the time. And, uh, to, you know, up until the time that you were about four or five years old. Uh, I always said, you mean you drank beer? And I said, no, I, uh, I did cocaine and really bad drugs, you know. And he did like that, you know, kind of his little eyebrows kind of furrowed, you know. And, uh, and I said, but I've been quit for a long time. I said, I quit five years ago. He said, uh, so the next day, Maureen, who's a wonderful lady that, worked, that lives with us, and his godmother, was worried about it. And so she went in and told him, said, Shooter, said, uh, are you okay? And he said, yeah. He said, well, is there anything your dad said to you yesterday that bothers you? And he says, oh, about him kicking drugs, <laughs> kicking coke? <laughs> You, oh, you mean about him kicking coke? <laughs> nah, that was it. Well, I must say, uh, they call him Shooter for a reason. <laughs> yeah, his you want to tell us that pistol. story? Yeah. You were in that room. <laughs> oh yeah. When he was born. Yeah, oh, he was. Yeah, he came out kicking and raising Cain, and promptly, 
He beat on the nerve. <laughs> and then there forevermore was known yeah. as Shooter. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> let's, talk, uh, let's talk just a little bit about the business of writing a book. Uh, you work with Lenny Kay on this, and, mm -hmm. and you turned down three other uh, collaborators before that. Talk about why Lenny Kay made a difference. When, they, when Lenny came around, you know, he, uh, he's very quiet, he's very gentle. And like I say, if you want to say somebody who thinks left and thinks right, well, I'm more right and he's more left, you know. And, uh, but there was just something about him and uh, the way he was, he's a great guitar player. You know, he works with uh, Patty Smith. And the other two, uh, the other three had just made me kind of disgusted with it, you know. And um, I thought, what in time? And then Lenny came and we talked and uh, he said to me, he said, I want to write a book in your words. It's going to be your book. He said, it's not my book. And he did that, you know. But I still said no. And then I got to thinking about it. And I thought, well, I might never find another person like Lenny Kay. And, uh, and I might not have, but I, I wouldn't take for it now. We spent almost three years, you know, taught him how to eat well done hamburgers <laughs> and took him out to West Texas, took him to this old redneck boy, Jimmy Stewart, <laughs> that said, hey, where'd you get that long haired heppy? <laughs> and he said, hey, heppy, if you cut some of that hair off, you could play horseshoes better. <laughs> so we put him through all of it and he, he stood the test. Even got out into a sandstorm, you know, he got to see a sandstorm. And he writes about that. And you, now did you dictate to him and then uh, uh, did he take down tape and notes and then and he notes. would write and it would come back to you? Yeah, I would. Uh, it sounds yeah. so much like you, Waylon. Well, it was. It was just, it really is. Because, you know, when I would want to change something, he never hesitated. He said, it's your book. You know, and there was things that, uh, he taught me how to write a little myself, you know and uh, that I had to change in there. Mm -hmm. 